welcome everybody. Um, people are still joining us, but I'm going to start anyway, um, because we, we have a lot of very eminent, wonderful speakers, and I want to give them time to make their contributions. I'm just going to introduce um, the, the topic generally um, by welcoming everybody to this online event with our expert speakers um, and to launch the research, new research into the relationship between national and local youth justice. Um, it's been over 20 years since the establishment of the Youth Justice Board and Youth Offending Team set up by the then Labour government. Um, and at, certainly at the beginning of that time, there was an explosion in sending children to what were and still are uh, disgusting and abusive prisons and an explosion of children being punished in the community. Um, now, work by the Howard League for Penal Reform has exposed the differentials in the imposition of some of the most draconian punishments in the community by some yachts with the ISS and tagging, which we saw and which we found was the route back into prison for some very vulnerable children. Um, decades ago, I've been doing this for a long time, so I remember when Hampshire, which was... Um, not known for its revolutionary zeal, but has led the way in becoming a custody-free zone with no children at all being sent to, to custody. Um, so it, it does show that on rare occasions, justice by geography can be a good thing. Um, and it's been local policing that's kept children out of the clutches of the criminal justice system. Police forces with the support of the Howard League have cut child arrest by two thirds, resulting in a dramatic reduction in child imprisonment. So justice by geography sets challenges. And whilst we want to encourage innovation, we also need to address discrimination, racism and paternalism that leads to punishment. So the balance between local and national control is the focus of this very important new research. Um, I am not going to introduce each speaker. You should have their impressive CVs um, on the apps that, if you've logged on to that. And I think Rob is going, Rob Priest, our, um, our comms manager, is going to put a little bit in the chat about each speaker. I will simply name each person. Um, to indicate their turn to speak, and they've um, got very short bits of time. But, but that means it will allow a little bit of time at the end for questions and discussion. So you're very welcome to post questions on the chat, but please keep them short. Please keep them brief because it's easier to monitor um, if they're the, the um, questions are brief. So the first speaker is Professor Barry Goldson, one of my very favourite people in the whole world. Barry. You're going to start us off. Well, Francis, it's not often that I get introduced in that way, but so thank you very much. And, and thanks indeed to colleagues from the Howard League for organising this event, to, to everybody who's registered, and moreover to Francis for chairing and Hannah Hazel, Jonathan Keith, Laura, and my co-author uh, Damon for comprising such a prestigious panel. And in the 10 minutes or so that I have... Um, to speak on behalf of both myself and, and Damon, I want to sketch three key issues, if I may, by way of introducing our report. Firstly, to say something about the background and context. Second, to refer to core research questions and methods. And third, to say a little bit about the key findings and some of their implications, at least as far as we see them for policy and practice. So to the background first, um, not unlike Francis, I too have been around for a little while. And the report is informed by uh, a long-term programme of comparative research that's extended over the best part of two decades and has at different points in time, including uh, included collaborations with a number of colleagues, both nationally and internationally. Uh, put at the simplest, the fundamental questions that have underpinned much of this work are how and why is youth justice uh, made to take the forms that it does in different places and at different points in time. The longer term project has two key strands therefore. The temporal strand, in other words, examining the ways in which youth justice systems evolve, adapt, reform and reshape over time. And the spatial strand, 
exploring the manner in which penal discourses, legal frameworks, policy priorities, different forms of intervention and system outcomes compare both between but crucially also within national boundaries and jurisdictional, jurisdictional parameters. Now the spatial dimension might be conceived as operating on three distinct levels. The transnational, or what some people might want to argue, is even the global level, the national and the international level, and the subnational or the intranational level. And for those who might be interested, um, I and indeed others have most recently explored the, explored the three uh, levels or units of analysis, including the conceptual, theoretical, and empirical challenges that they pose in two books, Juvenile Justice in Europe, Past, Present and Future, and Youth Justice and Penality in Comparative Contexts, both of which were published by Routledge in uh, 2018 and 2020, respectively. So for present purposes, it's the recognition that differences within a single jurisdiction may be as great, if not greater, than differences between jurisdictions that induced an appetite for empirically exploring the manner in which youth justice is made at the subnational level, and more specifically, the extent to which the concept of local penal cultures might help us to, to account for, for differential outcomes. And two studies have been pivotal in this regard. First, a collaborative project with the Howard Leap for Penal Reform that I designed and submitted to the ESRC for the case PhD studentship. The application was supported, the funding was awarded, uh, the doctoral studentship was advertised nationally, my co-author Damon was appointed to it, and he successfully uh, submitted an excellent thesis uh, and obtained his PhD in 2017. Meanwhile, with a team of colleagues from the University of New South Wales in Sydney, a substantial grant application was submitted to the Australian Research Council for a larger, longer term and more ambitious study, which we call the Comparative Youth Penality Project. The grant was ultimately awarded and one strand of the larger project has also comprised detailed investigation of the manner in which youth justice is made at subnational levels in both Australia and in England and Wales. For purposes of extending and developing uh, this strand of the Australian Research Council funded research in England and Wales, uh, we have revisited and thematically reanalyzed the substantial volume of qualitative data which was originally collected for the ESRC and Howard Lead project. And for the more specific purposes of this report, we've also collated and analyzed a further and extended tranche of secondary quantitative data. Now the research design and methods are set out in the report and we don't have time to rehearse the detail here. But suffice to say that by collating and analyzing a wide range of publicly available quantitative data, we were able to identify paired research sites at the youth offender team or local authority area level that are strikingly similar in respect of their socioeconomic demographic and recorded crime profiles, but markedly different in terms of penal outcomes, taking rates of child imprisonment as the key signifier of difference. Building on this, we've focused on three pairings one in the north of England, one in the south of England, and one in Wales. That is six yacht or local authority area sites in total. Each pairing can be seen to produce differential outcomes, whereby one site is characterized by significantly lower rates of child imprisonment than its, compared, than its paired comparator. Perhaps most interesting, the lower and higher patterning is shown to hold firm over, uh, over an extended period of time. And rather unimaginatively, we describe the site as lower towns and, and higher towns respectively. In short then, by looking across the sites, it is the resonance of socioeconomic, demographic and recorded pro crime profiles 
set against the dissonance of penal outcomes that forms our primary interest. Moreover, we've been concerned not only to identify and describe such phenomena quantitatively, but to attempt to explain it qualitatively by appealing to the concept of local penal cultures. And in essence, our submission is that the six constituent elements of local penal cultures that are elaborated in the report are especially significant for comprehending distinctive cultures that give rise to differential outcomes. That is comparatively low or, or high rates of child imprisonment. Now the conceptual theoretical foundations and implications of the research for the wider comparative project, for the, the wider canvas of comparative uh, criminology, have been discussed in detail in, in various publications, including the books to which I've referred. But we have deliberately tilted our research report that the Howard League is publishing to emphasize the applied nature of the work. Now, the panelists will no doubt have reached their own conclusions and assessments about the lessons and prospects that, that the research might or might not signal for policy and practice. But I want to conclude by very briefly flagging some of the key issues that the research raises, at least as far as Damon and I uh, have, have learned to see them. It seems to us that the lower town penal cultures offer vital lessons in at least four key respects. First, they appear to succeed in sustaining lower rates of child imprisonment that hold firm over time, irrespective of vagaries of, of the vagaries of national trends. Second, they promise to mitigate the problematic impacts and well-documented failings of child imprisonment. Third, they signal the means by which youth justice can be made and operationalized to best effect, both in accordance with evidence-based approaches and the provisions of international human rights standards. And fourth, they provide a foundation for realizing the application of the recommendation issued by the United Nations Global Study on Children Deprived of Liberty to develop strategies aimed at replacing the detention of children in penal facilities. Fin <coughs> excuse me. Finally, and in thinking about future prospects, we further submit the research might be taken to shape staff induction training and development programs across the full range of youth justice agencies and to inform the criteria and assessment methodologies employed by the relevant national inspectorates. Now, at this point, I'm probably reached my allocating my allocated uh, time share. So if I may, I'll hand back to Francis and Keith. Thank you. That's fascinating. Thank, thank you so much, Barry. That was really interesting. Um, policy made by evidence, such a revolutionary concept. Um, really interesting. Um, Keith, um, Keith Fraser, chair of the YJB, you're first to respond. Thank you very much and, and thank you very much for the invitation and Barry thanks for the um, work that you and Damon have done in relation to, in relation to this. Um, really pleased to be here to be able to um, discuss the findings of the report and it's probably worth acknowledging and it's obvious to you all from the outset that the youth offending teams, the youth justice board was an absolute core part of the major program of youth justice reform that was ostensibly characterized by more rigorous national direction, centralized control, standardized practice described by Barry. This was our modus operandum for many years and indeed today we still play this role, albeit to a lesser extent. Moved away from countless national indicators and overly prescriptive national standards, compliance against was monitored closely. This shift has been partially to do with the political landscape and partially to do with the Youth Justice Board's growing maturity. However, even at the heart of our managerialism, that's control, it's easier for me to say, there was considerable variation across youth offending teams in practice and culture. This is evidenced through inspection reports, for instance, 
This variation reflects the very nature of youth offending teams and local governance arrangements. However, as Barry highlights, this variation is also very much contingent upon local actors, and I'll underline local actors, their thinking and behaviour. Huge local variation, and also different devolved landscapes between England and Wales. Whilst the paper focuses on the um, use of secure across local areas, there is also a broader learning included, including that can be applied to help realize our vision of child first youth justice system and influencing policy and practice in line with this. So we are hugely welcoming of this. You will know in recent years that the Youth Justice Board, whilst continuing to deliver its statutory functions, has begun to adapt to the changing evidence base and is committed to trying to influence system change at government level and encouraging practice changes more locally. The six constituent elements identified by Barry offer us a real insight as some of the potential levers available for us if we are to be successful in influencing the change we want to see and of course further reductions in the use of custody is very much part of this. We need to find ways of communicating effectively with local actors from a range of professional backgrounds with different philosophies and perceptions and build a coalition. The change that we want cannot be forced but must be driven through hearts and minds. Through increased knowledge to help counter previous thinking and increased focus upon children's rights, ensuring that we all see children as children. Thank you very much for inviting me and I hopefully I've stuck within my time. I look forward to hearing what everybody else has got to say. You're all being so self-controlled, we're ahead of time, which is slightly worrying. Um, <laughs> but, but thank you so much. Thanks, Keith, that was really interesting. Um, and I, I, I really congratulate you on introducing, you know, on, on forcing through the, the children first concept in the YGB arts. It's, it's so good to see and so good to, to hear it reiterated all the time, really important. Um, our next contributor is Hazel Williamson, Chair of the Association of Yacht Managers. Hazel. Thank you, Francis, and, and, and thank you, Barry and, and Damon, for such a comprehensive report. Um, I could have talked for much longer, but I'm going to stick to my strict five minutes and I'm going to kind of focus on one, on one key area, really. But just a little bit about us, really. So our Association of Yacht Managers, we are all members. Uh, uh, all our members are heads of youth offending services or they are yacht managers currently working across England. Uh, we use our association to draw on all the breadth and depth of knowledge of our members. And, and really our focus is about promoting and understanding youth crime issues and, and for us playing our part in shaping youth justice. Um, so I'm really delighted as, as chair of the AYM to, to be able to respond to the report today. Um, and like I said, I am going to uh, kind of focus on one, one area really, and I wanted to focus on leadership. So leaderships in youth defending teams in particular. After all, it's the leader that puts the superhero cape on everybody. And most of our children need a superhero. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. I, I want to start, take us back to kind of modern youth offending partnerships. So that was the guidance document that was published by the Youth Justice Board in 2013. And that really defines and clearly make, makes it really clear what the yacht manager role should be. And it states that actually it should be a strategic leader who isn't buried in the layers of management. And also they make it clear that actually a yacht manager should be an expert in the field. More and more, our members of our association have been telling us that their roles are not being identified as strategic and not being seen as strategic leaders. And that members of their yacht boards, which is their governing boards, were often represented by less senior officers from their statutory agencies who have the responsibility for the, for the overall governance of youth offending teams. So, in late 2019, the Association of Yacht Managers undertook a survey with our yacht managers to explore this in a little bit more depth. And our survey was published in February 2020. And this evidence that there is a reduced sense of ownership of the yacht by local partners. 
And what we found was that some management boards are attended by agency representatives who have limited strategic influence across the local landscape and have limited engagement in the work of the yachts. Of those yacht managers that responded to our survey, 82% of those 82% of those managers said that they didn't have access to a pot of pooled budget or resources for which to pay their overheads or that could purchase their commission specialist services. So actually it was rather, so rather money, it tended to be those resources that were allocated to the service. And what we know is that it's widely recognised that the children that we work with have years of neglect trauma and unmet needs. So the inability to commission those specialist services then for us and put children at the heart of that makes it really difficult and more difficult for us to offer safe, robust alternatives to custody. It's the view of the AYM that that weakened governance that's apparent is part of which we found as part of our survey findings, threatens the ability for us as youth defending teams to offer a distinct and innovative and child focused service. We have been working closely with the YJB to review, refine and relaunch the modern youth defending service, the modern youth defending partnerships guidance. And we're hoping that that, that will encourage uh, local delivery arrangements to review their statutory guidelines and ensure that this cohort of children are given the prominence that they deserve. So building on good practice within and across the sector is a focus for us as an association. And we're working really closely with the sector on a sector led improvement program. We're focusing on coaching and mentoring for our new yacht managers. And we're also uh, offering peer reviews so that actually our youth offending teams can learn from those where we know that good practice is already evident. We're also offering a youth justice uh, uh, aspiring leaders course so that, so that our yacht managers can learn for other more, more established yacht managers. As an association, I think we're really committed to that development and improvement across our youth defending teams, because we believe that youth justice work should be undertaken by dedicated and specialist youth justice practitioners who are also supported by a, managers at a senior level positioned within a structure where they can influence change. So I started to talk about what is a superhero and saying that all our children need a superhero. So what does it look like within a youth justice setting? So it's our view as an association that the superhero should work closely with sentences to cultivate and nurture the relationships and to advocate the custody as a punish punishment for children lies in the loss of liberty and therefore it should be used as a last resort and if children have to be sent to custody then we would advocate that it would secure small units close to their home. We also think that the superhero should work closely with key stakeholders to prevent children from offending and coming into the criminal justice system and becoming those first-time entrants because we know that this costs both our children and society. We also think that that superhero should advocate on behalf of all our children so that they have access to all appropriate services within the youth justice system and shouldn't be excluded for any reason. We also think that that superhero definitely recognises that the children we work with are also victims themselves. And we should work with them because they're the experts of, of their journey. Being a yacht manager can be a lonely space. I should know, I've been here now for, for 11 years and within youth justice for, for, for 21 years. Um, and we work hard to ensure that our children get the best that we can give them. However, we're all too often becoming more constrained by the structure and the landscape in which we're working in. I'm very much hoping that this report that's been published today further highlights the reasons why we need to quickly redefine the leadership requirements across youth offending teams so that our children get what they deserve. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Hazel. Really interesting. And I have to say, I have met superheroes in, in yachts and yacht managers over the years. It's uh, some, some incredibly impressive um, people. It's, it's been very encouraging. Um, that's fantastic. Thank you. Our next contributor is Professor Jonathan Evans from the University of South Wales. Jonathan. Uh, thank you, uh, Francis. Um, I very much welcome this important report. Uh, it reminds us that notwithstanding changes in statute and national policy, youth justice continues to be what it probably always has been, uh, a, a local endeavour essentially that is made and remade over time. So it's a patchwork of local cultures and practices that develop as a result of discussions and negotiations that take place between practitioners, clerks, uh, sentencers, academics, local government officers, and uh, elected representatives. Now, as I'm here as a token TAF on the panel, I suppose I should comment on the Welsh dimension of the report. Um, now, exa exaggerated claims have, of course, been made for Welsh exceptionalism in youth justice, with Wales represented as the country of enlightenment on the one hand, and on the other, next door, you have the barbarians in the benighted wastelands of neighbouring England. This, I, I would concede, is a slight exaggeration. And indeed, John Muncy called out this type of um, crude Welsh exceptionalism a decade ago in his Illusions of Difference article, in which he argued that the differences within Wales were greater than that between the countries of England and Wales. At the time, I argued that it needed to be recognised that because devolution in Wales was still in the process of bedding down, it being in the, uh, in the often used phrase, um, a process rather than an event, progressive practices being developed in places such as Swansea would in due course be rolled out across the rest of the country, that it was a question of time before those kind of beacons of good practice, you know, were, if you like, sort of uh, rolled out through the rest of the country. What this report highlights, along with some other evidence that's around, is that the persistence of differences within Wales over this period of uh, 20 odd years. My reading of what has happened in Wales over the past two, two decades goes something like this. In what Mark Drakeford called the ragged constitutional settlement, a, a potential tension between the Welsh and UK mandates was baked into the composition of local youth offending services at the outset. On the one hand, Welsh government was responsible for social services, education, health and housing. And on the other, UK government was responsible for policing and probation. With the development of a distinctive Welsh policy agenda around children first, a formal commitment to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, and a Welsh youth policy that constructed young people as citizens with entitlements, the conditions were thereby created for a form of youth justice practice that could potentially diverge from the then youth justice board orthodoxies of risk-focused practice and net widening. What has become apparent in the intervening period is that some youth offending services were quick to occupy the policy space created by devolution and duly developed child first, diversionary and anti-custodial practice. Others though were slower off the mark and some were seemingly reluctant to embrace the opportunities available to them, perhaps on philosophical grounds. The work of Kevin Haynes, Stephen Case and Anthony Charles in one Welsh borough records how innovative and creative local youth justice leadership, especially when it is supported by sound academic research can result in significant impact at both the shallow and deep ends of a local youth justice system. That research helped the manager of that particular Welsh Youth Offending Service enormously in providing the necessary evidence for defensible practice when the inspector came calling. This report highlights the importance of leadership, as has already been mentioned, and I would agree with that wholeheartedly. Communities of progressive and child-friendly local practice are developed by youth justice leaders being outward facing, being actively engaged in networking, and being able to establish trusting relationships with partner agencies. 
But leadership doesn't come out of nowhere. And future leadership certainly uh, won't come out of nowhere. Our concern must now be to ensure that we nurture and develop the roots of practitioner culture. This has implications for the training, staff development and mentoring of current street level practitioners in respect of the core elements of being a professional. So I'm speaking here about knowledge based on an evidence-based, skills and values. It's vitally important we empower practitioners to resist the temptation to retreat into the role of compliant technical operative and instead have the confidence to exercise their professional discretion in the best interests of children and young people who are in conflict with the law. These practitioners are our future youth justice leaders, so it is extremely important we invest in, invest in them. Just one final point. In the meantime, I think we need to look closely at the location of youth offending services in local government structures. In Wales, I, I formed the impression that when youth offending services are located in the Directorate of Children's Services, there is greater emphasis on seeing children and young people holistically rather than privileging their offender identity. It also means that uh, taken into account are safeguarding and child protection concerns. So I think I'll just leave it there for the time being, but look forward to the panel discussion. Very much, Jonathan. I like the idea of um, a Welsh enlightenment. I have two Welsh born grandchildren, so I think that would be for their futures very important. Um, thank you so much. Really interesting. Um, this has all been fascinating stuff. Um, our next contributor is Professor Hannah Smithson from Manchester Metropolitan University. Hannah. Thank you, Francis, and um, thank you to the Howard League for inviting me to be a panellist at today's event in my capacity as chair of the Alliance for Youth Justice. And before I start, I'm quite pleased with myself that the curtain behind me actually matches the Howard League's backdrop hall, so I have a different curtain depending on who I'm speaking with. Um, so here we go. Um, Barry and Damon's work raises many issues and considerations that chime with the AYJ's philosophy. Um, but perhaps I should say before I go any further, there may be some of you who are unaware that the AYJ is, um, as a very recent name change, we were formerly the Standing Committee for Youth Justice. And I probably should make that clear in case people are wondering where this new organisation has come from. We're not new, we have a name change. Um, so yeah, the report chimes with the AYJ's philosophy. And the notion of justice by geography is brought to the fore in their report and its particular focus on child imprisonment as a marker of contrasting constituent elements of penal cultures is both interesting and insightful. Their description of positive and negative power to describe how the yachts in their research constructed and operationalized local penal cultures at first read may seem straightforward enough. However, addressing discretion, personality, perceptions, and philosophical foundations is no small task. As many people at today's event will be aware, the AYJ has a long history of advocating for change in the child secure estate. In our 2020 paper, Ensuring Custody is the Last Resort for Children in England and Wales, we recommend potential legislative criteria that could ensure, sent that could ensure sentencing or remanding children to custody is used as a last resort in future practice. I don't have the time to go through each point of this criteria today, but much of it is based on ensuring that all alternative measures to custody have been exhausted. And we highlight the role that yachts should play in this, but we are also aware that yachts are not an island. They encounter challenges and clashes of culture within and between different stages of the youth justice system. And I welcome Barry and Damon's conclusions that training and development around the constituent elements of positive power, as they describe it, should be inclusive of courts, police, and the secure estate. Without a systematic approach, children's experiences will differ dependent on which stage of the system they are in, potentially impacting on any progression of positive power within yachts. And while discretion and adaptations to national youth just, justice policy is a good thing, we cannot and should not operate a one-size-fits-all system. 
It needs to be grounded in knowledge informed approaches, a balance between penal welfare and offender management and an understanding and acceptance of the rights of the child. Without this, the danger remains that children experience postcode lottery type responses and coupled with the unacceptable figures around racism in the youth justice system, some children will continue to be disproportionately subjected to custodial sentences. I think also addressing, um, if I can refer to it as the elephant in the room, COVID, we cannot overlook the impact and implications of COVID on the youth justice system and the potential in a post-COVID world for differential treatment, depending on a local authority's priorities, budget and pre-existing philosophical foundations. We are yet to see the full implications of the pandemic and while in our own research at the AYJ and the HMIP thematic review of yachts in the pandemic, there is much to be celebrated in the way in which yachts have adapted and responded to service delivery during COVID. There are also grave and serious concerns around the impacts of court closures and custodial regimes. The pandemic has served to highlight even further that custody is not an appropriate means of addressing the needs of extremely vulnerable children. But while it exists, I fear it will always be used. I would like to go one step further with Barry and Damon's lessons and prospects for policy and practice. The time is ripe for whole scale meaningful change regarding the future and evolution of the English and Welsh youth, Welsh youth justice system. For instance, of, as other um, panelists have spoken about today, we're witnessing an, an acceptance and advocation of child first principles. Adopting the principles, though, rely on an acceptance of children's rights to participate in decision making, in service design and service delivery, something that may cause policymakers and professionals alike to question some of their own beliefs about the rights of children within the justice system. And while some research suggests that professionals can be resistant to new systems, this resistance is not always a result of cynicism. It can be a lack of confidence that the wider justice system will not adequately support them. Yachts need to be confident that working within a positive power paradigm, as um, Barry and Damon describe, will be met with acceptance and support at a national level and that the benefits of such an approach is not at odds with the national message, which in relation to child imprisonment should be that it is used as a last resort. Thank you so much Hannah and uh, first person to mention Covid so that's good <laughs> but you're right there there are future means that there are the huge pitfalls or opportunities and I hate to use that that phrase when with relation to Covid but it's it's a uh, it's going to be very interesting to watch and and uh big changes coming I think. Thank you very much, really interesting. Now our last formal uh, contributor is uh, Dr Laura Jaynes, who we all know and love well, um, and is the Legal Director of the Howard League for Penal Reform. Laura. Thank you very much Francis and thank you. I want to just start by congratulating the authors of this report. What an important a uh, piece of work. You know when a lawyer gets a report and covers it with sticky labels that they've really loved it. <laughs> so, um, and I hope it will have a really positive impact in practice. For example, if all the uh, youth offending teams in London, from where we know uh, a lot of the young people from ethnic minorities, um, who, who end up going to prison and creating that huge massive disparity within the custodial environment were to adopt the ethos of the lower towns, what a difference that could make. So the other thing of course um, I really love about the report is that it just resonates so much um, with what we have experienced um, in the legal team's work over actually a similar period of time that the report uh, covers. Um, I just want to pick up on a few small themes in my few minutes. Um, in particular, um, this uh, tension between top-down interventionism and local practice. Um, that is something that we see um, in practice every day because of course, and I have to accept, we deal with the top end, we deal with the children who end up in custody and I'm aware 
that's our perspective. But of course, uh, in those cases, we often come across yacht workers who want to avoid recall, who think that they know the child and who can safely manage the child's risk, but a decision is made centrally that that will not do. And we often get the sense that of, of those two different attitudes, uh, that yacht risk assessments are not taken seriously and the knowledge they have of the child is not taken seriously with all the consequences that are described in the report of a child spending a lot longer, sometimes a very unspecified period um, in custody with all the harm that that entails. And of course, that crushing of local decision making is going to be even more pronounced as the use of electronic monitoring comes in and crushes that down further. Um, another thing that I wanted to um, pick up on, and so many of our speakers already have, so I'll be brief, um, particularly, and particularly I know Keith has really um, treasured the, the concept of child first, is the language different differences that resonate throughout the report when you look at the quotes from the lower towns and the higher towns. And again, that is something that we see all the time in our work, when you see the lower town interviewees talking about kids and hope, but the higher town uh, interviewees talking about youths, offenders, and even at one point, hardened criminal types. And of course, um, that's something that we battle with day in and day out, persuading parole board judges, even just to call our child clients by their first name, because that's how they think of themselves. Um, another short thing I wanted to raise was um, in the custody section about perceptions of detention and perceptions of failure. It was very interesting to see how lower town interviewees saw their experiences where, where children um, breached or or were not able to um, manage community orders as failures by themselves, whereas the higher towns, um, the, the interviews talked about the failures of the children. And one thing that always really strikes me is how many of the children I work with um, often talk about how they've let us down, as we always say, of course, you haven't let us down, but that heavy burden that children too often take upon themselves, feeling quick to judge themselves as failures. So finally, where do we go next? How can we use this brilliant research to forge change just as we are at a, a time where I think we are at a turning point, potentially uh, with the child prison population set to expand if the uh, punishment bill um, comes into force and also um, in any event with the extra policemen on, on the streets. Uh, what can we do? Um, for example, um, would the uh, six constituent elements that are raised within the report as really vital areas of difference be something that the inspectorate um, should be measuring when they are looking at youth offending teams um, and their performance? Thanks, Laura. So Laura has posed a question, so the first question to us, uh, which is incredibly important. Um, and the, the role of the inspectorate, I think, is is role of the inspectorates, because there are several involved, um, is incredibly important, both at, at, at sharing knowledge, sharing good practice, making sure that decision making is appropriate. Um, does anyone want to comment on, on their experience and their views on, on how they think that that could, that could be both a good thing or a bad thing? And I've got several other questions that have come in, some uh, from the chat and then some submitted before then. So I'm just going to see who wants to raise a hand. And if nobody does, I'll ask another question. Unless, Laura, you want to answer your own question about inspectorates, because I think it'd be interesting to hear your views, because you've had a lot to do with them. Um, the inspectors and and Barry. So let, let's hear Barry first and then Laura come back. Well, thank you, Francis, and, and, and indeed, thank you, Laura. And um, as you will see, our concluding recommendation, such as it is, is that the findings should inform inspectorate um, criteria and methodologies. And the question puts it its simplest here is that if you have um, to, to borrow our vernacular, lower towns and higher towns, which are extraordinarily similar in terms of their demographic, socioeconomic and recorded crime profiles, but fundamentally dissimilar in terms of their outcomes, surely that raises a question 
that inspectors need to exercise themselves with? How do we understand this? And if we conceptualize, and Keith and others have said that the child first justice is such to uh, regard um, excessive or inflated rates of child imprisonment as problematic, um, shouldn't the inspector ex exercise themselves with that? Indeed. And I, th I think inspectors have often said that they are hampered by looking only at service delivery at a local level and they're unable to look higher up to, to balance that that discussion. So that would be an interesting change. Anyone else want to, Laura? Yes, and I, and yes, I completely agree with what, what Barry has said and, and, and of course that's what gave me the idea to pose the question was because of the, the, the conclusion in, in your report and I was just having a look at some of um, the recent inspectorate reports and I think it would take a bit of a cultural shift among the inspectorates um, and I was interested in the last annual report for 2019-20 actually criticised youth offending teams for not prioritising offender management and being too close to children's services which is a concern actually and I, I, I think that it would be really useful for uh, the inspectorates to read your report three times. <laughs> Indeed, at least. Uh, we will make sure that happens, Barry. We will make sure they read it three times. I, I promise you that. Um, I, I have a question that was sent in in advance, which I think is interesting. Um, and it's a bit long, but I'm, um, it was uh, sent in advance by Lorraine Atkinson. I'm going to read, and then I'm going to ask Damon if he will respond first as um, a very important part of this research. Um, and she asked, what do panel members think needs to change to ensure that all professionals working with children in the criminal justice system have a full understanding of children's rights under the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and are also aware of the evidence that shows the negative impact of a custodial sentence on children. Um, so the report clearly shows that some professionals were lacking both in the knowledge um, and understanding. So um, Damon, would you like to respond to that first and then if anyone else wants to wave at me. Great. Yeah, thanks very much. And yeah, thank you very much to the Howard League for hosting this event and uh, co-panellists for, for coming today and, and giving such insightful um, comments. Um, so absolutely, this is a really important question uh, for us to think about. And this is what came through, particularly in the data in the lower towns, um, that there was a real kind of high level of uh, human rights consciousness amongst practitioners and leaders within these lower towns and really privileging the ideas of uh, ch uh, children's first, children's first justice uh, and privileging the ideas of um, minimum uh, length of time in prison, detention as a last resort, uh, and decarceration and decriminalization as kind of real core philosophies and ways of working within the lower towns particularly. And I think what, uh, what was kind of apparent within that was the leadership promoting those ideas through training uh, and not just within the yachts, but as uh, uh, Hazel I think uh, indicated earlier, around each stage of the youth justice system. that There should be training uh, uh, at the uh, shallow end right through to the deep end in terms of working police, the courts, and within the prison service, um, obviously in youth justice, uh, YOIs, the, um, really promoting and uh, that training around uh, children first and around kind of human rights and our obligations under uh, UN conventions uh, of, of the rights of the child and other rights-based, um, rather rights-based kind of approaches that we, we have an obligation to, to promote. So I think at the core of that is around training and understanding um, at all levels of, of, of the criminal justice system, um, youth justice system. And that was really evident within, within the data um, and real kind of support um, within, within practitioners, uh, from practitioners in the lower towns, but really being driven by uh, leadership uh, at the top within, within the yachts uh, and across other services. Thanks, Damon. That's really interesting. Keith, I wonder if you'd like to bring those two questions together. So it's about the inspectorates and their roles, but also about sort of children's rights and knowledge um, amongst professionals, practitioners. I mean, um, if there's anything you'd like. Thank you for a simple question there, Francis. Can I, can I, can I take it? Well, here. 
<laughs> can, I, can I take back to an observation I wanted to um, make earlier on? And it was in relation to a, a point that Laura brought out, really. It was something really subtle, but quite significant, I thought, in relation to kind of two different cultures that she picked up on relation to the language that was used between higher town and lower town. And for me, it's potentially how that culture then has an in impact on outcomes for children. And so for me, it'd be an understanding around what's what's driving that that those cultures within those different youth offending teams would be really interesting to try and understand. Because I'm sure that all of us here that are listening to this and also the panelists will have picked up different language about the same children, depending on who you are talking to. So I'm really interested in trying to understand what's what's driving that kind of difference because I think we'll start to get to the heart of why we start to look at children differently when we should be looking at children as children. And that, I think, sorry, Barry stuck his hand up there. Yeah, uh, you carry on. And I will, we'll, we'll go to Barry and then Hannah, I think, as well. Okay. And then taking it back, and I think that kind of moves on to the point you asked, asked about in relation to the inspector and also that wider kind of um, rights approach, child first approach. For me, this is it, it's it's a mindset around one around the evidence that sits behind um, child first and a child focused approach. It's not just a mantra, which kind of frustrates me when I hear it being spoken about in that way. There is an awful lot of evidence which sits sits behind all of that, you know. And I'm really thankful to Stephen Case and others who've supported us in some recent research work as well from Loughborough to kind of you know to support the evidence base behind the child first approach. So I know it goes way back before this current focus in, in relation to um, that the youth justice board has now got in relation to child first. But I think it's a real hearts and minds piece as to, <clears throat> excuse me, how do we make that real in the minds of policymakers that this is something which does look at children, it also looks at victims, it also looks at safer communities and doesn't, you know, differentiate between the two, you know, if we treat children as children within and outside of the justice system, it has benefits for children, it also has benefits for children and also safer communities, and we're not playing one off against other. So it's at that policymaking piece, but also how do we make it real for, for practitioners? So these are some of the conversations that I think that we that we need to be having to um, to kind of to coin a phrase, make it kind of real for people. And and for me, it's not a conceptual thing. It, it's something which can produce tangible outcomes and benefits. And I think it's how we work together to actually demonstrate that in a real way from policy. But then how we how that kind of then fits in with the um, with practitioners. Thank you, Keith. Hannah, you indicated, I think. Yeah, thank you, Francis. Um, I just wanted to follow up on the question around um, the knowledge around um, UNCRC and children's rights and the negative impact of custodial sentences. I mean, I think just following on from what Damon said, I think around the education of youth justice professionals is absolutely integral to this. And, it, and to a certain extent, it does have to come from leadership. But um, you know, these the education around um, children's rights and, and the and the UNCRC must start much earlier than youth justice. Um, you know, um, schools and so on. Um, children have rights in all these in all these different establishments that they move through, um, from children to young people to adults. And I think the other point I wanted to make about that is, if professionals don't aren't kind of ad adequately I guess up to speed with with um, children's rights then how are those professionals educating children about their rights because we do know from the work of, of for example Byrne and Lundy that um, you know children don't are not aware of the rights that they have as children um, and if professionals are, are not familiar then I think that we are some way off educating children about the rights that they have and just to go on to the negative impact of custodial sentences on children I think um, this might sound rather blunt but I think um, people need to speak to children who've been in custody to understand what it would be like for a child to be in custody um, more research needs to be undertaken with children who've experienced custody 
um, to give children, and I'm not talking about the surveys that are carried out, you know, annually in the, in the youth custody um, estate. Um, I'm talking about, you know, real, um, you know, in-depth qualitative work with children to really give them a voice in exactly what it is like for children in custody. And for someone who's just finished um, a series of interviews with children in custody about their experiences of COVID, I mean, it is a sobering, absolute sobering kind of listen to, to what that has been like. And I think until, we, again, we educate ourselves around the experiences of the child, we, we don't move forward um, quickly enough. Thank you. Thank you very much. Actually, that leads on very nicely to a question that was posed in the chat, which I'd like to ask everyone to respond to, which was um, posed by Dr. Cathy Hansen. Um, would you support the abolition of the detention and training order? Mm. So who is going to respond to that first? I will if you don't. Oh, Barry. Barry. I'm very happy to uh, respond to that question and even to take it a stage further. I have been on public record for a long time advocating the abolition of penal detention for children. Um, it's not a, an emotive, it's not only an emotive response to that, that's a, a very deeply embedded evidence-based response that can draw in actual fact on 200 years of evidence. And one of the mistakes that we often make in having conversations like this is assuming that what we've learned over the last five or 10 years is began at year zero. We've known for a long time that custodial detention for children is profoundly damaging, utterly counterproductive, uh, a ridiculous and obscene waste of public money, um, and a gross violation of the most fundamental human rights. Now, this is not to say that there aren't certain occasions when children's behavior is so damaging and dangerous to themselves and or to others that some form of restriction of liberty might be legitimate. But they are, in actual fact, in short, very um, limited uh, numbers. And local authorities secure children's homes are the most appropriate um, uh, institutions um, to attend to those uh, children's needs. And it gets back, I think, um, to a, a kind of issue that is rippled around the conversation so far, is that to what extent youth justice systems can actually be uh, led by child first or child rights principles. Um, and it's actually the, the wider system of statutory and non-statutory services that need to own these issues. Um, and we might want to think about not only abolishing penal detention to respond to the question, but the extent to which it's legitimate to abolish systems that are ultimately backed up by punishment in order to address children's needs. And not for the first time, I entirely agree with you, Barry. <laughs> uh, thank you for that. Other people want to contribute? Uh, um, Hazel, thank you. Hazel? Thank you, Francis. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't disagree with you at all there, Barry, on a, on a personal note. I, I do think we've got a lot to learn about other countries where they don't lock children up. Actually, they're dealt with in a very welfare-based society and the community supports, you know, looking out and taking care of those children. I think that actually... Um, you know, we've heard what Laura said about the annual report from, from the inspectorate, which says actually yachts are not focusing enough on offender management. So actually, as a yacht manager, you're then battling with actually I need to satisfy the inspectorate, but actually I really want to work with our children and young people in a child focused way. So how does that legitimise and, and give permission to our practitioners then to work in that very child focused uh, and child values based way. I think that we, we are absolutely at odds with, with, with that approach really. And if we look at 
our cohort of children and young people in the youth justice system. What we know is they're also our children who are probably in the care of our local authority. They're probably our children who are excluded from school. They're probably in Prus. They probably have suffered uh, long term neglect. Their parents may also have been known to to services. And, and actually, the, the inspectorates that sit around those agencies are those that focus on safeguarding, for example, our Ofsted inspectorate, as, as an example. But actually, we, we choose the inspectorate for this cohort of children that, that is focused on punishment and, and rehabilitation. So there is, there, is, there is that tension between the inspectorate and actually, you know, what, what, we, what we're being expected to del deliver, uh, which is the national framework around child focus. And, and, and being child first and that essentially as yacht managers that, that's the place that we want to get to but it's always that struggle thank you thanks Hazel. i will come back to you keith because i think that's an important question for you but i want to ask jonathan about wales because the architect of the dto is a police and crime commissioner in south wales <laughs> i happen to know um and in fact the architect of the, the, the youth justice edifice structure um was was it's his he, he's very proud of it um and so you know it's it's how and of course where um youth justice is not a devolved issue yet but uh, is it may well um come to wales quite soon mm. well thank you for in rugby you call that a hospital pass i'm being asked to comment <laughs> on alan on alan michael um, which I won't, I'm not going to kind of uh, go into ad hominem sort of criticisms of Alan Michael, but I, but I, I think it just proves that uh, Wales is not, uh, is not the source of enlightenment. Uh, it's not completely, you know, there's some good practice in Wales, but also uh, some bad things come out of Wales as well. I mean, to answer the, um, the, the question directly, then I, of course, I mean, I absolutely uh, support the idea of abolishing DTOs, which if you remember, were sold as, um, as a, as a vehicle for constructive custody. And uh, we've now had the experience of, you know, successive inspectorate reports over the years to show that actually it, this has not been a constructive uh, experience for the overwhelming majority of uh, children who go through that system. Moreover, you know, we know that uh, most of our custodial institutions are unsafe places. Uh, so I, I, I think that, I think, of course, I think that absolutely has to be a first step towards the kind of uh, vision that, uh, that Barry outlined earlier. I would just like to say this opportunity as well to say that I absolutely support what, uh, what Hannah and Barry have said about the ownership of children's right, rights going beyond, um, you know, youth justice. My experience, particularly with one local authority I know very, very well, is you talk to social workers, you talk to youth justice practitioners, they're very, very sort of uh, up to speed on children's rights. In areas such as education, however, um, you, it's not so much that there's hostility, but it's just that there's a lack of awareness, there's lack of discussion about that. So I think we need to sort of look well beyond the youth justice system uh, in order to really embed uh, children's rights. And I would re remind you, actually, in Wales, uh, we have the children's measure, which uh, means that um, statutorily there is a requirement to uh, pay due regard to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. I think some agencies do that really quite well, but there are other agencies that do with children um, that do not. And again, I'd say it's not necessarily hostility, but I just think there's so much educational work and exhortation that needs uh, needs to go on and I think this is about sort of leadership in those particular sectors. Thanks very much Jonathan. I'm going to ask Keith to respond because I know he wanted to, to say something on that and I'm, then I'm going to ask one last question um, on race and uh, sex discrimination and differentials and I will then go to Laura on that because I know she's doing some work on it for the Howard League. So um, Keith do you want to Sort of wider points, and it picks upon Barry's point, really. We've recently been started doing an assessment of um, the children that are in the justice system have either received a caution or, or some type of um, order or sentence. And you'll all know significantly the vast majority of those children have either got speech, language and communication needs, mental health needs, substance misuse needs, etc. So Barry's point about the youth justice system not existing in its own kind of universe, it's about those actors outside of the universe and what's, what's their part in relation to that, in relation to education, health, uh, local governments, et cetera, in relation to, for me, if a child has got those vulnerabilities, it's not inevitable 
that they come hurtling towards the youth justice system. So what is it that can be done to actually, you know, to prevent that? And I think that work that the um, Youth Justice Board is doing in, in support with, with others around understanding the vulnerabilities and needs of children actually demonstrates where you can work more effectively to stop children from moving further in. And when, you know, when the, when the Crime Disorder Act was set up in, in 1998, there was, a, there was the P word in there called prevention. So does there need to be some more focus around, around prevention now? What, what does prevention mean? What, what's desistance mean? We, you know, we're still struggling to understand a, a, a common definition from that, you know, from years on when, the, when, the, um, when this, was, when this was, was, was set up. Now, somebody's mentioned in the chat about the Youth Justice Board previously not supporting Child First. I'm not going to try and defend previous positions of the um, Youth Justice Board. But what I would ask is that there is one the acknowledgement around where the Youth Justice Board has come and where it's at. And we've all got a part to play. You know, the Youth Justice Board is learning. It's evolving and it's, we're learning from each other in relation to that. And, and it'd be great if we could have some acknowledgement of the journey that we're all on together. We're not all going to be asked on it at the same, same pace. So I think if we've got an aim in mind and a vision in mind, we need to be supporting each other and try and look forward and support each other in relation to moving forward. And, you know, in the Youth Justice Board, that's why we've reached out to yourselves in relation to some of the academics who supported us in relation to understanding and have helped our understanding, which has then shaped policy. So I'd look for us to support each other and learn for each other, learn from each other on that journey. Yes, that's a very good thought. Thank you, Keith. Um, we, we've got a lot of the questions. We're not going to get to them all, but I, I thought the question from Lorraine Gelsthorpe um, on uh, linking to um, Barry's work and the justice by geography issues about race and sex as well as differentials there. Um, and I just wanted to give Laura an opportunity to talk about the work she's doing, particularly on race. And then, it, then I will leave a final word to either Damon or Barry um, before we come to the end, because I think that's an important issue to cover. Laura. Thank you very much. Um, I think actually the way into this is through um, the rights lens, because of course, those uh, lower town um, interviewees and areas that were taking a rights-based approach which includes prohibition on discrimination when you're looking at the enjoyment of all other rights had the better outcomes which is why when I was talking about the uh, terrible discrimination and racial disparity that we see which is it's the most acute manifestation as the report says over 50 percent of children in prison from black and ethnic minority backgrounds that is why this report is so exciting because it shows a solution to the thing that we have been tearing our hair out over for a very long time that if you pick up on those six constituent elements and you cherish them and nurture them you can reduce custody and therefore you will reduce discrimination and it's something as Francis mentioned we've been working at the Howard League um, trying to create an anti-racist guide for lawyers because as Keith says we do all need to play our part it's not just yachts have to do this and judges have to do that we've all got to um, really grapple with what it means to take a rights-based approach and not just the theory of it but what taking a rights-based approach means for Billy on Tuesday when he's about to go to court or whatever or, or as actually Hannah said um, for Billy when he's seven and about to be excluded from school. Um, so I think the report is incredibly exciting because if we really take it with both hands and learn from it then I hope that that we can actually do something to tackle um, the racial injustice that we know. And also, again, with, with a, a harm that we know, the particular harm that's caused to, to girls, again, an individualized approach, an adjusted approach is always going to create better outcomes. So that's my thoughts on that. Thanks, thanks Laura. Um, we're coming to the end. We can't deal with all the questions. What are, um, and I'm, I'm going to ask Barry just to, to say the last few words if he wants to. Um, but before we get to that, it, there are other questions that have come up in the chat and we will respond to those um, because they are some really interesting and difficult points. Um, and I, I don't want to lose the, the, the questions. So they, they will get a response. Um, 
Barry, is there anything that you want to say to, to conclude, as it were? I think my concluding comments would be that, uh, again, to reiterate, reiterate thanks to the Howard League, to reiterate thanks to the panellists, to reiterate thanks to everyone who's registered and attended the event, and indeed all the questions that have been raised in the chat. We could, in different circumstances, have a three-day conference when we're actually meeting in person to discuss all of these issues. There's no way that we can cover them in an hour and a quarter. But Damon and I conceive of this report as a beginning, not an end, and the conversations, the debates, the discussions, the arguments will continue. If I may, I'll just end on a very provocative note, which is this. My friend and good colleague, Hannah Smithson, said that we also need to engage children more in terms of their participation in youth justice systems. I would like to op op offer an argument that moves in quite the opposite direction, that we need to remove children from youth justice systems. And we may be able to do that first by uh, significantly raising the minimum age of criminal responsibility, um, which will go some way to address many of the problems uh, and issues that we've been discussing. Uh, this evening and this afternoon. Absolutely agree with that. And and because I think the, the chances of this government or any government passing legislation to um, raise the age of criminal responsibility, the Howard League has been working very hard with the police to stop the police arresting children in the first place. And the number of children under 13 or 14 um, who've been arrested by the police has absolutely plummeted. So we're trying to achieve the raising the age of criminal responsibility by the back door by changing practice. Um, and I would just hope that, that we can carry on doing that because if, if the kids don't, the children, young people don't come into the system in the first place, they don't go through the system. And of course, as research has shown, um, they don't then commit more crimes. So um, the, keeping children out of the toxicity of the criminal justice system is something we're all working for. Thank you so much, everybody. It's been absolutely fascinating. In an hour and a quarter, we have covered so much. Um, and thank you to people for participating and thank you for um, joining us. Um, and my final point is do join the Howard League, do um, become members or become donors. We are an independent charity. We rely on that support. We don't take grants from government because it means that our independence is something we guard. Our independence and our integrity is something we guard very fiercely. So do join us, everybody. Thank you for participating. Uh, we will this has been recorded. It will be available for viewing again, and we will respond to people who um, who ask for questions uh, on the on the chat. And there are more events coming up, so keep an eye on our website. But thank you so much. That was really really interesting. What a fantastic panel we've had. I'm very grateful to everybody. Thank you.